So this was our second session, ladies and gentlemen, and our third session is all about what's next. And there are two outstanding uh, speakers with us. Thank you very uh, much. First speaker is uh, Admiral William Owens. He served as Vice Chairman, Joint Chiefs of the Staff Committee of United States of America, and he's also the Chairman of Red Bison Advisory Group. Our second speaker from Pakistan is uh, my mentor, my teacher, and my elder, my very dear friend, General Zubair Mahmood Hayat, who has served as the Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee from 2016 to 2019. He's our second speaker. The format of the session is uh, 20 minutes each for both the speaker, Bill and General Zubair. And this will be followed by Q&A, question and answer session with both of them. So welcome, General Zubair. Uh, nice to see you here and welcome from uh, welcome uh, bill uh, from uh, california so two uh, of you are here uh, brilliant professionals and uh, experienced professionals and this is the concluding session after first session on economic impact and second session on pakistan's foreign policy the title of this session i'm repeating again what's next 20 minutes each for both the speakers followed by question answers over to you bill Please unmute yourself, Bill. Well, thank you, friends, and thank you, Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be with you here today and to be with uh, General Hyatt. Um, uh, I uh, speak to you here before the sun has risen in Seattle, Washington, and I gather that the uh, acoustics and video are okay. Uh, I, I want to say to you that I've been out of the military for over 20 years. I have no security clearances because I don't want any. And I, when I retired back in the late 90s, I decided I would move as far away as I could from Washington, D.C. And uh, I've stuck to that over these last 20 years. So I speak to you mostly as an American citizen and a businessman, not as a military man, although I uh, enjoyed my time in the military enormously and I had several visits to Pakistan during that time. Uh, I feel uh, somewhat close to the people of Pakistan, have done a lot of business with uh, all of you. At one time, I was the CEO of Nortel Networks and came to Pakistan a lot at that time and have had many great uh, visits uh, there in Pakistan. Uh, I'm going to take a little different twist in this discussion uh, because I must say I can't add very much in detail about Pakistan other than observations of Washington, lots of conversations with people in Washington, and a perspective from the west coast of the United States. Um, I, uh, I, I am a different creature in the United States even. I grew up as a very poor farm boy in North Dakota. Uh, uh, had never been out of the state of North Dakota. Saw a television show on called The Men of Annapolis and I was looking for any way to get out of North Dakota and I saw that the Naval Academy was one of the ways. If I had known how how uh, rough the oceans were, I probably would have chosen the Army, but I, I was in the Navy all of a sudden. Uh, I was a riverboat captain in Vietnam, uh, became a submariner and spent 2,000 days of my life underwater, much of it under the uh, Arctic. Uh, my wife will tell you that's the reason I am the way I am today. And, um, and then later in my career, was the commander of the Sixth Fleet and was the commander of Naval Forces during the first Desert Storm. I've spent a lot of time around the world um, and uh, have come to know a lot of countries and my observations are from the heart. So I'll take a little different twist on this because I don't think I can add too much to the discussion on Pakistan, although we all follow it very closely and I stay fairly engaged in what's happening in Pakistan uh, today. A real tragedy for everyone, I would say, especially the citizens of Afghanistan. 
So I'll say a few words about that uh, later. Um, I, uh, I have been mostly involved, even in my military career, as, as someone who was fascinated with technology and strategy. And uh, my major message to you today is about our children and 20 years from now. And I find in the United States, we are almost devoid of discussions of what it'll be like in 20 years. But I think it's imperative that we take a position which is in consonance with that for the good of our children. And we, they deserve that we provide them a vision of where we as a nation, whether it's the United States or Pakistan or China or India are going in the future. We have an opportunity to look in the future. Some countries do that quite well. The Chinese look into the future uh, very, very, very much and rely on that as a part of the efficiency of the way they interact with other countries in the world. Um, when I was in the military, I would just tell you uh, that it is possible to move militaries, even militaries, even the U.S. Pentagon, even the U.S. Congress. So I was deeply involved in the maritime strategy of the United States, which was designed in the Cold War to put maximum pressure on the Soviet Union by doing things we had never thought about before, by surging nuclear submarines to their uh, main ports and then letting them know we were there, uh, by uh, surging aircraft carriers, right into the aggressive fronts that where they had never seen our carriers before to let them know that we were there and we were able to do something that was not good for them. Uh, that in large part changed the strategy of the United States and it was possible through just a handful of people to set that scene for the way we would be with our strategy in the future. Later, when I was the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the number two person in the U.S. military, I became fascinated with something that we call the revolution in military affairs. Um, it was a thesis that broke what I think was the long-standing equation of the use of military force. I think we should all take this to heart. It's especially relevant today. It was a thought that in the future with technologies, with systems of systems, with all of the new technologies that are being developed very rapidly, we uh, as the Western alliances and especially the United States could put together a, a system of systems which could see a very large area of land, perhaps the size of Afghanistan and that we could see everything quite specifically within a few feet. And that if you could do that, whether it was at sea or on land, all of those things we used to treasure so much, ships and tanks and airplanes became targets. And if you could do that with the revolution in military affairs, you could change the way your effectiveness was in uh, any kind of adversity with the United States. We put a lot of money into that. We, during my time, we cut the number of ships and tanks and airplanes almost by half, and we reduced the defense budget by 50%. It is possible to have a grand strategy and execute it, which is my point. It's also possible to have a grand strategy at a more national level. And the Chinese are very good at this, for example. I think it's very important for our children that we look 20 years in the future. And I don't know how many people are doing that with Afghanistan or with other countries of the world or with the relationship with the United States and Pakistan, which should be stronger, or with other relationships in the world. I felt so strongly about this about a year ago. I'm not advertising this book, but 
uh, wrote this book, China US 2039, The End Game. It was an attempt to look at the way it would be in 20 years when China was clearly number one economically in the world, when the technologies of the US and China were about the same, when there was no clear dominance. And I made a number of policy recommendations that the US should pursue over the next 20 years. For the good of our children, and the preface to this is written for our children, because many of us will not be around. Younger men like General Hyatt will still be around, but I won't be, I think. And so, you know, I think it's for the good of our uh, next generations that we put in place strategies like this. I would have to ask for all of us, what's the strategy for Pakistan for 20 years from now? What do we want to have happen and how will we make it happen in the face of these changing situations in Afghanistan and the tragedies that we've experienced over the last uh, just few days and few months. The loss of 150,000 people in Afghanistan in the last 20 years, a number of American troops, five or 6,000 with contractors, the loss of um, Afghani uh, forces, the loss of civilians has been a tragedy for all of us. And I would hope that we learn lessons from all of this. I would hope that there is a future ahead that, um, that uh, allows the large countries of the world to look at that world in a different way. The countries of China, India, Pakistan, um, and if we look beyond Afghanistan, if we look to uh, the world at large, the large countries that will will forge where our children will be, the large uh, Islamic countries, Indonesia, clearly Pakistan, um, India with its large number of Muslim people, uh, the, and, and the United States, China, Brazil, how do we forge that future? Or does anyone think that we can? I think we can. Who works on that today? I don't know. I don't know who does that. But we should, all of us, because we represent something not about ourselves. I would offer to you that I think we have failed. We have failed in so many ways, including the United States with Afghanistan, that we need to look at that new future in a new way with an eye to our children, grandchildren, and their well-being. Uh, it will be at our demise if we continue the day-to-day -day political uh, battles like we have in the United States and in the world. If we don't come together as people, it's going to be very, very sad. I would just tell you that in my experience, and I've seen many, many countries, and I've been there a lot, including your country, I would just say that we are good people, all of us, the Muslims, the Jews, the, uh, the Christians, the, the, the Pakistanis, the Indians, the United States, China, we are, we are good people. But I must say, sometimes the leadership digresses. And there's all kinds of issues, including in the United States. Do we care about our children? Do we really care? And if so, why don't we take opportunities to do something different? Maybe what's happened in Pakistan is a great opportunity because now it's going to be very much up in the air unless we find a way to accommodate the new Pakistan. The new, the new world, which is uh, apparently going to be run by the Taliban, uh, the strong relationship of Pakistan with, uh, with the Taliban and the Pashtun. Um, China has some serious interests in uh, Pakistan. India, as the previous speaker mentioned, has interests, but is not benefited by what's happened in Pakistan. The United States clearly has a role, Europe, et cetera. 
why don't we look at 20 years from now and what we can do? I think that economic support for Pakistan is enormously important for the people of Pakistan, for the peace of the area. Let's take it as a place that we can make an example of what we, the leadership in many cases, which has failed our children, can do to set up a new structure. There are very few places in the world more important than in Afghanistan for uh, establishing the right kind of relationship, one which does not support terrorist groups, one that is, uh, is uh, sponsored in some ways with funding from other countries, one that stands for the rights of women and, uh, and other disadvantaged groups, and one that can set a new pathway for the next 20 years for the region, not just Afghanistan, but for the region, for China, Pakistan, India, the United States, et cetera. So is that impossible? I don't think so. I think it takes a few people to step up to this, to do something. And the doing is very important, is very difficult when you're trying to run for a particular political position or you have some other agenda which in many instances has very little to do with those children that we're trying to set up for in the future and has very little relevance to vision or strategy. So uh, I'm not lecturing, I'm lecturing to myself and the United States as well as I say such things. Um, I want to just say that my life has been led mostly around technology. And what's happening now in the world of technology is changing everything. I see it in the businesses I'm associated with. Um, the, um, the health solutions that are coming, I'm on the board of a couple of companies that will change our lives in terms of old age, dementia. I, I want them to hurry for my benefit. Uh, and and the the areas of quantum sciences artificial intelligence robotics are dramatically going to make a difference i think now i'm going to step back to my military experience that the new mutual assured deterrence is not nuclear weapons uh, many of us in the military were quite aware of things that were happening that were available to us to destroy another country. We knew the beginnings of some of this. <clears throat> and, and I believe that revolution in military affairs, for example, if you look at, say, China and the United States, I think that, you know, in 2039, we, the United States, will have an ability to see with great detail almost every item in a large piece of piece of land. And it's that system of systems, except it's much smarter. It's artificial intelligence, it's uh, quantum sciences, it's robotics. And we will see a very large piece of land like Afghanistan with great detail. I mean, when I was the Sixth Fleet commander in the Mediterranean, I had some of that experience in the first Gulf War with the United States and and uh, and Iraq, Saddam Hussein uh, specifically, and and I could start to see the beginning of it. Then that was twenty years ago, thirty years ago. Today it's much more. I assume I have no clearances, but it's much more. And likewise, other countries, China, are developing these same kind of uh, observations from airplanes, from ships, from satellites, all integrated together with a common structure and with an ability to see each other's battlefield. Think about it. If you're the president of a country and your military comes to you and says, we have an ability to see that entire battlefield and you could pull the trigger and eliminate the communications, the radar, many of the people in that country uh, in 30 seconds. And I wonder how many leaders might take that shot. And if they do, then that mutual assured destruction precludes the other country from acting. We could talk a lot about that. I'll just leave it there. 
I think that people-to-people -people programs are enormously valuable. For, a num for about 10 years, I have run a program with American four-star generals and Chinese four-star generals to come together twice a year, five of them, to meet one year in China, the next year we would do it in the next meeting, we would do it in the United States. And over a 10 year period, we had 28 American four-star generals meeting with a similar number of Chinese generals. We had not known each other before, but I can tell you friends that when you meet for two days at a time, you talk about issues, you uh, you socialize, you get to know each other's grandchildren, that everything changes. And I like those guys. I like them. And I think they like the American generals. And when we were together, it was really different. And I have found that to be the case in every country that I've had experience around the world. We should do that. And we should have people to people programs very high on our priority and be sending students back and forth to uh, each other's countries to talk about the way we are and to learn more about the other countries. Um, I'm going to conclude shortly uh, with, the, with simply the fact that we have uh, an ability now in the United States to have a 20-year vision. I don't see it relevant to what we're talking about I don't see anyone in the US who is setting that up. And honestly, I don't see it in your country either. I don't see it in India. I don't see it anywhere except China. They have a 20 year vision of what they'll be like. And I think this is an opportunity to step up to what it's going to be like for our children and how we can make this world a better place. And maybe Pakistan is a great place to start. So with that, Mohammed, I'll conclude my comments and I look forward very much to General Hyatt's comments and hopefully he and I one day can establish a group of Pakistani generals and admirals and American generals and admirals and we'll get to know each other's grandchildren also. So it's a great joy to be with you this morning in the, in the conference. I wish I could be there in person and I, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bill, uh, for your presence here very early in the morning uh, in California. I am uh, grateful to you. And this is our second time interaction we are hosting today uh, virtually. But two years back, I hosted you in Karachi. And this was uh, in person. So but thanks to digital technologies and digital platforms that we are able to connect you uh, to listen to your views and uh, perspectives on the subject. Our second speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is General Zubair Mahmood Hayat. He served as Chairman Joint Chief of Staff Committee for Pakistan from 2016 to 2019. We hosted him several times when he was the Chairman Joint Chief. And this is his, his first time virtually uh, virtual participation with us. Uh, in my uh, personal and very honest opinion, I am saying this with complete responsibility, that in my opinion, he is the best person in Pakistan today to speak on geopolitical issues. Over to you, General Zubair, uh, about what's next. And in your case, what's next is for the global uh, scenario, as well as the regional scenario, as well as for Pakistan. What is next? Over to you, sir. Please unmute yourself. Yes, you are unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, very clear. Uh, thank you very much, Asper. Thank you, Rachel, for you know hosting me once again, but this time in a new format. It's new for me. I'm also not very technologically savvy, uh, but uh, uh, thank you, Admiral Owens, also for making me feel young <laughs> and also for uh, letting this framework being set um, not for today, but for tomorrow and the future generations. I thought that was a, a brilliant way of framing this whole equation. I think that brings a little bit of uh, humility and sense uh, to the discourse uh, that is happening today. Uh, I found uh, today's uh, conference, and I uh, you know, virtually saw all segments of it, 
but to be very rich and enlightening. And I thought this was a, a wonderful experience uh, to be to be a part of this. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm a little perplexed by all the hype that we, I'm seeing on the television, as if the world has come to an end and there will be no tomorrow. Uh, you see, you have to see Afghanistan in the context of Afghanistan. And what we are actually witnessing is something not very new. Uh, this is a 40 years conflict start, which started in 1979 and has seen two swings. And it is now coming uh, to a conclusion of those two swings. Uh, you see, when you apply military force, it is applied for a purpose of a, a very specific political military objective. But if you start to shift those objectives and you start to get into a game where you do not know what you are working for, then you get into endless wars. So, at least in my capacity, for more than 10 years, I've been hearing various uh, political leaders, military leaders, uh, talking about ending this war. And now that we are coming to the end of this war, suddenly we want not to focus on the end of war or the future tomorrow, but we want to focus on what's happening on, in Kabul airport uh, and one or two blasts which have taken place, which are very tragic in their own sense. But if you look at the context of it, I think this is very important to look at the bigger picture and take a step back. You see, last 40 years, there has been a huge cost of war. And I'm not talking about the 2.2 or 2.6 trillion that some of our academics would like to quote when that is a part of the cost of war. But the cost of war in terms of social destruction, psychological destruction. You see, two generations have been lost. And that's a huge cost to pay. You know, Europe, when it fought the 30 years war, you know, it altered the way Europeans thought. And here we are, you know, ending a 40 years conflict. And we still want to glue on, on, a, tree, on, a, on, a, on a television screen and make our strategic judgments. That I think is erroneous. You see, Afghanistan, because of this 40 years of war, has seen a lot of collateral damage. I mean, how many of us know how many wedding parties were hit? How many funerals were hit? How many birthday parties were hit? And we have some square figures, but I think those are very rough of the number of people who got killed or got injured or who were actually uh, you know, displaced. I know the figures for Afghanistan may not be as well known, but I know the figures for Pakistan. You see, Pakistan lost more than 80,000 Pakistanis in the last 20 years alone. 80,000 dead. Just imagine the cost. And of this, there are more than 8,000 soldiers, 30,000 soldiers who lost their limbs or were badly, badly injured. So, you see, what is happening is that we are just opening a new chapter. The book of Afghanistan is the same. It's the same book that the British were reading. Is the same book that the, the Russians were reading, it's the same book that the Americans were reading, is the same book that others are reading since 15th of August. Because what hasn't changed is history. What hasn't changed is geography. What hasn't changed is culture. And may I dare say what hasn't changed is the interest of the people that exists. So how you frame the interest, I think, is very fundamental at this moment. If you frame the interest 
in the context of a great power competition rather than a notion for the future generations and the future of your children because it's not the future of generations of children living in beijing or washington or london or paris or islamabad that matters it's 194 countries in this world whose children matter nigeria is going is already a country with huge population pakistan by about 2050 will be a, a country of 350 million people now so what do we want i think that's very clear at least to rational thought we want security we want stability and we want relative peace we want human rights whether they are for women or men or children or minorities and we want an integrated and a connected world now if that is what we want then our choices will be very different but if we want to focus on a great power competition where one would feel that his civilization or his way of life needs to be imposed on another civilization or another civilization's way of life then even this 40 years of war would not have taught us anything we can then end up fighting another 40 years of war or another 400 years of war so what we don't want i think is more important than one you what we want we don't want another 40 years of war we don't want another civil war in afghanistan we don't want a zero sum game we don't want a great power competition being played at the expense of the people of the region and of the people of our countries we won't don't want safe havens for terrorists whether they are isis or imu or ttp or etim we don't want afghanistan to become a drug safe haven which at this moment is and let me remind you when taliban were running afghanistan in in the late 1990s that was the only time in the history of afghanistan that it became drug free we don't want afghanistan to be a gaming room i know of the number of weapons and munition that has been tested new in afghanistan i know for sure and i don't want to waste time on that because it's sort of a gaming room people can you know play games and now that you have remote controlled weapon systems you have smart munition systems you have uh, you know uh, you can be sitting up 7000 miles away and yet you could be killing people and you could be thinking you are in a gaming room you don't want a gaming room in afghanistan any longer you don't want an imposed system you want a local system which is owned by the people because they are the people who live in that area the mountains of that country belongs to them the rivers of that country it belongs to them the resources of that country it belongs to them the minerals of those country it belongs to them we don't want afghanistan to be used and now i specifically zoom into pakistan also to be used as a reverse front for stabbing pakistan in the back that's something that we most definitely don't want and therefore we don't want any spoilers in this i think for the first time in 40 years there has been a there is a sense of opportunity and really there could be an end to conflict and this opportunity has been created not by this administration i know president obama wanted to you know pull out mr trump actually made this decision 
It's only now that it has been executed. So in this new opportunity, I find that there could be an Afghanistan for the Afghans, supported by the others, where there is greater prosperity, where there is greater acceptability of their own government, where there is ownership of their own systems, and where they are free to make mistakes, and where they can find local solutions, but with the help of regional players and international players where there is less corruption, where people are not taking away money in bundles and flying aer aeroplanes to various capitals of the world to buy properties and have their children settled there, where there is less crime, where there is less drugs. Now, if that be the case, then to me at this moment as a military man, my biggest worry is what happens to that 300,000 force that was supposed to be the world's best trained and equipped force which evaporated in nine days. It was a mistake to have thought that you could create an artificial force through an artificial mean and sustain it artificially. And you saw that when it happened, it crumbled like a house of cards. And I have been personally part of those discussions where very frankly, we were telling our counterparts in all parts of the world, including Admiral Owen's part of the world, that this is precisely what will happen. But obviously uh, we were not able to probably either communicate or probably there were bigger issues at play uh, which uh, did not allow this friendly advice that was being given by friends that this will not work. We require a political solution to this problem. And the more you try a kinetic solution and an artificial kinetic solution, the bigger the failure will be at the end. So to me, the question now is what kind of a balance of power that will occur? And I think if we try and tinkle with the balance of power artificially once again, as we did in Bonn during 2001, 2002, we would land ourselves into trouble. So what kind of a governance structure they want to have? What kind of a security structure they want to have? What kind of an economic structure they want to have? Let the Afghans decide. I have no right to tell an Afghan what I think is right for him. He has lived in that part of the world for centuries and millennia. He's a better judge for himself. I can help him, I can advise him, I could be there to support him. I know in one of the meetings, one of the US senators um, had wanted to say that he want, they wanted to help Pakistan. Uh, and he himself you know, came up with this uh, analogy. He said his mother used to tell him that help people the way they want to be helped not an imposition, imposed help. So therefore, let me give you five conclusions and then I end and we can take question and answers. My first conclusion is we must allow space. We must not mount diplomatic, political, economic pressures like sanctions, like over the horizon operations, and still try and continue to th do things that have not worked in 40 years and thinking that those kind of tinklings will help somehow in the future. Number two, we should help Afghanistan in the manner that they want to be helped. We should communicate with them 
we should talk to them. Above all, we must listen to them. Three, we must also support regional approach. You see, beyond Afghanistan, there are countries that have stakes. There are more Pashtuns who live in Pakistan than there are Pashtuns who live in Afghanistan. And similarly, all around. So therefore, the regional approaches must be in sync with the international approaches, but basically in support of Afghanistan. Fourthly, we must be very clear that there will be spoilers in this. Those who have believed in war economy, those who have believed in using Afghanistan as a base for exercising their strategic options, they are not likely to give up these things very easily. Therefore, these spoilers have to be identified and marginalized if not excluded altogether. And last but not the least, my advice would be, we should not demonize people and we should not demonize nations. You cannot build a future by demonizing others. I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, General Zubair, for your thought-provoking address. And now I'm starting questions from uh, both of you. My first question is that uh, what you what can you advise your governments to do differently with regards to Afghanistan first and with regards to each other? And my second question is what military options does the United States and Pakistan have post evacuation? And what would you advise your respective countries and to each other? This is my question to, for both of you, and uh, you are requested to answer both questions. General Zubair, I'll let Edmund go first on this. Well, um, I'm not an expert, as I said before, but uh, advice to governments. Um, in the United States, I would hope we would take a very wise position here to do a lot of listening uh, to those who are most engaged, the Pakistani uh, leadership, the, um, the Taliban, um, and always with an eye to establishing pretty much what General Hyatt implied which is a new framework to use um, to use this situation in in Afghanistan as an opportunity, an opportunity to uh, open new relationships with uh, the Taliban. I think they're going to need a lot of financial assistance from all countries uh, for the good of the Afghan people. And we all should be prepared to uh, be doing that for a new Afghanistan. Uh, of course, as we all agree, I think, to uh, ensure to whatever degree we can through diplomacy and partnership that there be no further support of terrorist activities for the good of all countries and that we find a way forward uh, to deal with this new world and try rather than painting it as a um, as a series of issues that are political in the United States Republican or Democrat in many cases congressmen haven't any idea about Pakistan or Afghanistan or uh, any of the surrounding countries but to look at it as an opportunity to do something new, again, for the good of our children. In the sense of the evacuation, I think it fits together with all of that, that we would hope that um, there would be a protocol in place that would allow for um, continued um, passing of the Afghanistan borders by people who want to get in or out 
and uh, that we make that clear that that's a part of a new reformed Afghanistan. And I think the United States should try to stand, as Pakistan has so well over the years, with um, the, um, the, the issues of human rights and the things that America does stand for, uh, human rights, justice systems, rights for women, et cetera, as General Hyatt also implied. So I think that's the framework I'd like to see from the U.S. government. I believe that uh, as far as uh, Pakistan is concerned, it can play a very proactive role. And my advice, uh, and I'm not, as I said, I'm a retired man, uh, I, I say nothing official, but uh, my advice in whatever humble capacity that I am in would be basically to upscale uh, the engagement. If I was to sum it up, it's time to have not one cup of tea, but three cups of tea and understand this through communication, through engagement, and by keeping uh, the, the focus on the future and the way we can uh, you know, make sure that having learned lessons from this 40 years of conflict, we help, first of all, the people of Afghanistan who have suffered the most. And then, may I also say the people of Pakistan We've also suffered the second most to come out of this conflict and, uh, you know, find for themselves new opportunities. Uh, and they are given this in a, in a fashion where they feel they're a part and parcel of this growth and progress and that they're not pawns in, in a bigger game. It's time for the region to start breathing fresh. And I think we should seek that opportunity through engagement and having three cups of tea. Thank you, General Zubair. <laughs> My third question is that uh, around $85 billion worth of American military hardware provided to the Ashraf Ghani government is now in the hands of the Taliban. How concerning is this to the United States and to Pakistan? First, Admiral Owens and then uh, General Zubair. Well, I think it all comes down to how would it be used? And that comes back to the previous question. How open are we as the, as the nations of the world to accept the, uh, the certainty of Taliban rule in Afghanistan and then to support that rule in gracious and thoughtful ways for peace. Uh, I was, I was, if if I may, I was reading Pakistan's founding principles for foreign policy, and if I may just say it from your documents, the founding purpose of Pakistan's foreign policy is one of friendliness and goodwill towards all the nations of the world. You know what? What a great statement. We should impose uh, our thoughts, not impose, but we should bring those thoughts to the way we are in the United States and the way the, Afga the Afghanistan leadership, the Taliban, are about the way they look at this new world and this new opportunity. And so I think it's inevitable that if it goes the wrong way and the Taliban decide that they must use that equipment against the principles that both General Hyatt and I have been talking about, this can go very badly and we will find ways to then punish each other for what has happened, which is just wrong. We need to find a way forward now, not two weeks from now, but now, so that there are common understandings uh, among us, the Pakistani government, the United States government, and the Afghani government to uh, have that understanding about where we're going and then try to implement it. Uh, as for my, uh, first of all, I'm not very um, certain about the cost that has been attached to the equipment that has been left. I, I have seen this 85 billion uh, figure, but I, I really don't have an authentic touch onto this. 
Uh, my second take is that most of the equipment that we are talking about is basically non-kinetic in nature. Uh, for example, there are more than 100 MI-17 helicopters that are now in Afghanistan. Now, uh, this is about more than the MI-17 helicopters that are held in Pakistan. And this is about 50% of the helicopters that India holds as, 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 you know, in that. But MI-17 helicopter per se in itself is not a lethal uh, piece of an equipment. There are more than 85,000 vehicles uh, that are present there in Afghanistan, of which this costing is being done. And, and we know for sure uh, a Humvee is a Humvee, and it can go from point A to point B, but it's not a fighting vehicle. There is very few new ordnance and munition that is there in Afghanistan, and that's my take on that. Uh, but now let me come to the other part of this. Uh, part of this, you see, any military instrument is basically an ins a political instrument in the hand of those who yield power. And therefore, if, for example, this, these weapons, these uh, instruments that I talked about, the MI-17 helicopters, the Humvees, for example, at this moment, there is drought in Afghanistan. If these MI-17 helicopters and these Humvees are used for transportation of, you know, wheat, flour, and medicine to the people, then you see the entire context of this complete infrastructure and uh, capability available will change. So the more important thing at this moment is to engage with the power which is there in Afghanistan and not to play with the games of legitimacy and otherwise. We should not leave a vacuum. Allow a fundamental engagement to take place and therefore affect the policy level. And through that policy level, make sure that whatever instruments are there and whatever capability is there, it is used for the purposes of good. That's my take. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my another question is that the Europeans and NATO behind closed doors are very critical of the U.S. withdrawal. Many are questioning the very purpose of NATO, given the United States seems to act unilaterally when it suits them. What is the future of NATO? And is the European military alliance on the cards? My question to uh, Admiral Williams and followed by General Zubair. Well, <laughs> I wish General Hyatt would answer that question, not me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, many of us in the United States are very disappointed at the way this was done. You can read the American press. There's, a, there's an article in The Economist this last week that properly, I think, um, uh, addresses this issue. Um, in not a very favorable way to the United States. And, and so in the US, as you all know, probably right now, there is this Republican Democrat battle about the words that are being used about this. And I worry about that because we're not addressing the, the, the issues, the facts of it. We're just throwing words back at each other. And, and what is clear is that the United States has lost uh, an element of uh, honesty in all of this, in the way this was done. Um, the uh, It's easy to take shots at other people, and so I won't do that, but there, there, are, uh, there was a lot of information available in the United States uh, leadership to uh, probably have handled this a lot better with the reality of what was really going to happen with the intelligence reports that uh, I'm sure the Pakistani military had as well. And, and so we, we uh, didn't help the United States reputation around the world. I think NATO will stay together, but the, the, the deficit that the United States showed in real vision and planning here certainly has repercussions that can't be denied. And I don't think NATO is going to fall apart. There will be a lot of effort to hold it together. There are other what would be called more immediate threats 
um, than uh, in, in the European countries than what seemed to be happening in Afghanistan. That's right or wrong, I don't know. But uh, NATO will stay uh, together. Uh, the United States, I'm sure, will try to do a lot of mending inside the alliance to keep it as strong as uh, we can. But at the same time, a great deal has been lost. Thank you. Now, General Zubair, please. I believe that the purpose of NATO and, and whatever EU military alliance in future that you're talking about has very little relevance to Afghanistan per se. There are broader security constructs to which these kind of military alliances they look at. Uh, I, for one, have believed that since the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, there could have been a different world construct to security. Because if you keep one alliance on one part, then there is a natural tendency for others to try and craft their own security architectures to balance those kind of alliances. But I think we lost that opportunity somewhere. And now we stand as where we are and the kind of a great power competition in which, you know, one way or the other, by fault or default, people are trying to head into. I do not see NATO going anywhere uh, in the near future. As far as EU's military alliance is concerned, uh, I think you have seen in, in last 10 years most definitive signs of unease in Europe. Uh, and, and those signs are uh, beginning to take some shape. Uh, whether Europe would ultimately decide that it does require a, a, an independent Euro uh, European uh, you know, identity to their security architecture, uh, is, is the jury is still out there. But the initial signs uh, can be picked up. Thank you. Thank you, General Zubair. Uh, my another question is that uh, the American retreat from Afghanistan, a reflection of the overall global American foreign policy shift. America's focus seems to be on its commitment to Israel in the Middle East and containment of China in Asia. How do we see America's involvement in Afghanistan and Pakistan moving forward? Admiral Williams and later General Zubair. Well, I think it remains to be seen what our involvement will be in Pakistan, but I, uh, I believe that there is a growing reality in Washington that, um, that the solution in Pakistan is to provide some support, financial and perhaps otherwise. I would hope, and I think this is happening, that there would be if anything, a stronger relationship with Pakistan and, and exchanging information, all with the goal of a stable Afghanistan. I think it'll be very difficult for American politicians to quite say it that way at this stage, but I think the diplomacy and the direction that I sense is happening is in that way to accept the Taliban government, uh, find ways to provide financial support, uh, ensure that they are opposed to terrorist groups of any kind, and to uh, find a way, I hope and pray, to work with Pakistan in this common problem that I think both of us have. And of course, I think there's a lot that the Chinese feel that way as well in Afghanistan. So. I think there is an opportunity here for us to come together in ways that we have not been in recent recent years. Thank you, Admiral Obens. Uh, what is your view, General Zubair? You are, please unmute yourself. I think this is a big question. You see, at this moment, I think the U.S. needs to change the prism. If Pakistan will be seen through the prism of New Delhi, or if Pakistan continues to be seen by the prism of some of the generals who fought in Afghanistan and saw something from the other side of the hill, it requires a change of prism. 
I think if the prism is neutral, you will find opportunities that will emerge. I think if the prism is colored, if, as I said, Pakistan is seen through the prism of New Delhi, or for that matter, is seen from the, through the prism of uh, Beijing, it will be a very different equation. And I think the jury is out there. The opportunities remain, but there are dangers that are lurking. Thank you. Thank you, General Zubair. Uh, my question to Admiral Williams, uh, do you continue to support and see U.S. military intervention through boots on the ground, drone strikes, or other kinetic operations as a viable tool to achieve national security and foreign policy objectives in the coming years? What is your personal view on this? Well, I would hope that violence on the ground uh, is uh, a, a challenge for all countries, for the government of Taliban, who certainly doesn't want to see that. I'm sure Pakistan doesn't want to see that. And the United States doesn't want to see that. So I would hope that this is a time not for the military, not for politics, but for diplomacy to talk about these issues. And I have every hope that diplomacy can do uh, something that military force cannot and that politics cannot. And if we genuinely have our diplomats working together behind the scenes to formulate the right solutions for Afghanistan without supporting more than minimal use of force, for example, against terrorists, I think that this is a possibility of a new start that could be a good new start. Thank you, uh, Admiral Owens. My question to you, uh, General Zubair, Taliban seems to care more about engaging with China, Russia, Qatar, Iran, and Pakistan, and less so about America. Will we see Afghanistan under Taliban join the non-American regional bloc? What is your view, sir? I think we should be very careful how we try and frame uh, what Taliban think. Um, I think the Taliban's have been in deep engagement with the United States for a very considerable period of time. After all, whom were the Taliban talking to politically in Doha? They were not talking to China. They were not talking to, to Russia. They were principally talking solely. In fact, whatever regional mechanisms were there, the regional mechanisms, you know, there was a Russian mechanism which was going on. You know, there was a Chinese mechanism which was going on. There was a Turkish mechanism which was going on. But of all the mechanisms, the, China, the, the Taliban, if I could, you know, sense anything, they were putting their eggs in the American basket and talking to the Americans. And it was with the Americans that they stuck the deal. And even today, you see, when there is the situation is so murky, and I would never like as a soldier to be there in that kind of a murky situation. But yet you look at the coordination on ground that is occurring between the US troops and the Taliban troops on ground, it is very phenomenal. It is, I think, uh, one of the rare examples that I have seen that when you have soldiers standing 10 yards from each other with very different worldview and philosophy and trying to maintain peace at the same place. Two years ago, I know for sure that there had been a strike against the ISIS in Nangahar where Taliban information had helped the US to actually carry out that drone strike. So I think your question is mostly based upon What's the narrative that is taking shape in some of the press, press uh, that is up there? Deep down, I think, there is deep engagement at the intelligence level, at the political level. But because nobody wants to you know, own that up, nobody wants to show up and say, or raise his hand and say, yes, there is this engagement, because there is a political cost attached to it. Nobody is prepared to play that political cost. And I think sooner that we come out in the open, and start being more realistic and deal with the realities on the ground that it is, the more it will be better for all of us. Thank you.
Thank you, General Zubair. And uh, Admiral William, you, are, you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say I agree with General Hyatt's wise comments there. I think that's uh, that's exactly right. And we need to preclude the politics from getting in the way of a good solution here. And so maybe this takes a while, but we have to say our prayers that it will go that way. And uh, I think every indication, as he said so well, is to have us proceed that way. And I pray that will happen. So my last question to both of you, and I asked this question in the first edition of Afghanistan conference on last Saturday. But this was actually my opening question. And uh, I asked this question with two civilian leaders, Senator Sherry Rahman and Dr. Shiri Mazari from Pakistan. And here, two of you are military men. And this is my closing question. I want a detailed answer because this is a very academic question. What lessons can the world learn from America's war in Afghanistan? This is my concluding question. Well, if you want me to go first, Mohammed, uh, I, I, I would say there are so many lessons of a general nature here uh, that uh, we, we should certainly document these lessons. I was in Vietnam, and it seems to me that many of the same lessons uh, can be learned here as from Afghanistan. And we should not allow the years uh, between uh, events like Vietnam and Afghanistan to preclude the headline lessons learned. Uh, the United States, I believe, and I think many Americans, both political parties, but most Americans believe that uh, nation building is not something that is going to be successful in any case, that we cannot, as I think General Hyatt said earlier, we cannot go in and establish a new national culture, a new direction, a new religion. We have le learned that lesson, I think, in two instances, Vietnam and here. I think that when we, when we get intelligence that drives the national leadership, to believe we are uh, winning, I use that term loosely, uh, that we need to be very cautious in the context of what I just said, that winning is not definable in the sense of uh, all that has gone on in Afghanistan, unless you establish stability, uh, peace, and uh, a, a nation that has a foreign policy, much like the one I referred to that Pakistan has stated in the founding documents. And so I am of the view that um, there are many lessons learned. I hope we will have pieced them together with Vietnam. Um, the, the, the advice of a military uh, general in the field may not be the overall best advice for a leader of a country not to refer to a particular win in a portion of the country, but to refer to the overall direction of where the people in that country are likely to be shifting. And I don't think the United States has done this very well. So I think many of the things both the general and I have been talking about relate to a common theme of peace and a better relationship with other countries, support from other countries for the right things, and a taking a turn now for a new future, again, for our children. And so I just leave my comments there. Thank you, Admiral Lovins. Uh, now, General Zubair, please. I'll give you five bullets of lessons which I think are important. One, never go against the lessons of history. Two, ideology cannot be beaten by force. Three, imposed orders will never sustain. Four, occupation never works 
in the long term. And last, but the most fundamental, we should be aiming not at winning war, but we should be aiming at winning peace. And that can only be done by winning over the people. Thank you. Very good conclusion. So I'm grateful to uh, Admiral Delovens and General Zubair Mehmood Hayat for your valued participation. I think this is a very academic session, brilliant uh, contribution from both of you. And uh, with this uh, session, we are uh, closing this uh, second part of the Afghanistan conference. Uh, there are few thousand Pakistanis are attending this conference, not only from Pakistan, but from different countries, the Pakistani diaspora, as well as the international community is also participating. A few hundred foreigners from various countries are attending this virtual conference on Afghanistan. And this is the second part. And I want to share all of you again. I want to repeat that uh, on coming Thursday, we will upload the complete report of both editions of Afghanistan conference at our website nutshellconferences.com and uh, I'm again grateful to all our speakers, panelists, moderators and our closing session keynote speakers Admiral William Owens and also General Zubair Mahmoud Hayat and uh, with this note we are closing this conference the conference is adjourned thank you very much Thank you very much.